Welcome everybody. I'm Jessica Davis, Marketing and Communications Manager for Fear Free. Thank you for joining us for Puppy Socialization. Is this puppy normal or a lemon? Sponsored by SIVA. In this webinar, Dr. Elizabeth Feltis, ACVB resident in private practice, and Amanda Ike, veterinary technician specialist in behavior, will review normal puppy socialization and development and how to identify lemons who may show up in your practice. If you have any questions during the webinar, please be sure to enter them in the Q&A section. We will have a brief Q&A session at the end of the presentation. We're very excited to have Dr. Feltis and Amanda speak with us today. So on that note, ladies, take it away. Thank you. Thank you for having us. We're excited to be here. All right, so let's get started. So when we talk about behavior, this is a team game. And that's one of the reasons that Dr. Feltis and I are doing this as a team presentation. Every team member in the veterinary practice is part of puppy socialization and part of identifying if these puppies are normal or abnormal. So what we're gonna talk about tonight is gonna to be primarily socialization and abnormal versus abnormal, or normal versus abnormal, excuse me. <laughs> I'm excited about the abnormal. <laughs> and so what we're gonna talk about next time, so if you join us for the next lecture in the series, that's gonna get into the not normals or our little poor lemon puppies who need some lemonade uh, and what we talk about and what we do uh, as a practice for intervention for those puppies. They're super cute. We love them. And one of the things I want you to think about is how many do you see in a week? When you think about all the puppies that come through your door in your practice, what if there were some key nuggets that could help you identify some of these puppies who may have some issues? How could we help them stay in their homes? And if they stay in their homes, hopefully they're gonna stay in your practice, which means that we can maintain that revenue for the clinic. If there's a way to predict behavior problems, wouldn't you wanna know that? And then be able to successfully intervene for those little guys sooner than later. When it comes to development, we have a few different developmental periods that we talk about when we're in school. We've got neonatal, which is birth to day 13, transitional, which is day 13 to day 20. And then for us, one of the more important ones is socialization. And that's week three through week 12. This is a genetically programmed timetable for these little guys. And we oftentimes wanna think about it as a slow closing window. The door is not slamming shut at week 12 where they no longer can learn or have new experiences. This is a slow closure that happens over time. But what we do know is that these early developmental processes have a lot of influence over the dog that we get as an adult. So when we think of socialization, there are many ways of thinking about it. The first, which is important, and Saunders Dictionary tells us, it's a period of time when there's a critical age in a young animal that it is most likely to establish its social relationships. That period in canines is week three to 12. They're learning how to allow cloaks cross, oh brother, close <laughs> proximity of others to themselves. It is a period of time that allows attachments to occur to places as well. So that reduces environmental fears. It helps them learn to experience different situations and experiences within the environment. It's the most influential nine weeks of that puppy's life. And this is when we should be thinking about exposure to not only living, but non-living things as vital to their normal social development. What do you see during this period of time? They acquire bite inhibition. They start to feed on semi-solid food starting at week three. This is socially facilitated by group feeding. And those of group sleeping, such as in the litter, it changes to becoming alone around week six. Weaning begins at week four and ends around at week eight. So that occurs within this period of time. And again, they have self or species identification. That raises concerns when all that puppy sees are those of the same breed, such as within, let's say, a breeder's environment. You don't get that puppy till 12 weeks of age, and all he ever saw was Bichon Frise. <laughs> and that's it. It's never seen a lab. It's never seen a German Shepherd. 
And what do they think of those individuals? It's helpful in exposure before week 12 to say, hey, this is also somebody else you should experience and be comfortable with. What else do you see? It's evidenced in this period of time by more exploration. They're willing to approach novel objects and move about within space. That does begin to decline at the end of that period of time. So around week 12, social following of others begins, tail wagging occurs, and you don't see those fear postures really emerge towards, until towards the end of that period of time. They do have an attraction to urine and ball movement odors, which is helpful because this is when we want to potty train. This is when we want to teach them where to go to the bathroom. And they begin to avoid soiling within their sleeping and resting spots. What's important is this coincides with physical changes. How do we evidence the social period? Heart rate, so let's start there. So there's a sharp decrease around week three. It coincides with a decrease in the sympathetic nervous system activation or fight or flight. So it's gonna stay at a decreased rate until about week five when it begins to start to increase to its peak around week seven. And that's when you start to see stranger danger. It all is brilliant in how it all coincides. That's when your primary fear period begins and you start to see those things all begin to occur because it is a physiological process. After week eight, that heart rate levels off to adult rates. Myelination of the spinal cord occurs now. That's why they're locomoting around and they're running around as happy, playful puppies, hopefully. The EEG pattern becomes that of an adult in week seven. So you still have an, you know, a juvenile pattern before that. Teeth eruption begins, and that's why they start to change into eating semi-solid food. And vision is at adult rates at, towards the end of this period of time at week eight. But that's not the only way of thinking about it. So socialization is also a process. Miriam Webster educates us in that socialization is the process of exposure of a young domestic animal to a variety of situations in which to minimize fear and aggression and promote friendliness. That's our job in helping them with this process. Exposure should be structured to accomplish the promotion of friendliness. It shouldn't be overwhelming. You need to incorporate interactions for that individual, such as which their lifestyle or that dog's job should include. Remember, dogs without human exposure by week 14 make poor companion pets. If you want them to be around things such as this picture, a soccer game, that dog should have exposure of an appropriate distance, an appropriate level that allows them to remain relaxed and be able to experience this as something positive within their life because that's what we expect for their lifestyle. When we're actually looking at the socialization process, we like to think about it as kind of an effort to investigate or interact. And then we're going to add in reinforcement. So we're going to pay for that effort. And then we're going to observe, is this puppy interested in continuing that interaction or not? Every puppy should have the chance to say no. And that's really important. You have to avoid strong fear-inducing situations or stimuli because when you think about it, they are sensitive to forms these social relationships within this period of time. Because of them being able to form these relationships, they are at an increased risk of being vulnerable to psychological stress. What does that mean? That means I am really willing and able to explore and interact and make these new cognitive processes and pairings, but I am also vulnerable when something really scary occurs. I can make just as cement of a process pairing that that thing is scary for the rest of my life. So yes, you're able to make new things that are wonderful, but you can make new pairings that are really scary as well. So one of the things we want to look at when we're talking about socialization is actually body language. So we're going to watch a couple videos here of two different puppies who have a slightly different reaction to the same vacuum cleaner. So this is a little puppy here, a little lab mix. So the technician is going to step into the hallway and we're bringing in the vacuum cleaner. 
So as you can see, this puppy is increasing its distance. It's looking at the camera person. The tail wag goes down. It's very low and the ears are forward and it's watching the person and I'm going to approach the person. I might get a cookie there, but I'm not going to go right up to that vacuum cleaner and sniff it. So what Rachel is doing is she's placing some food treats out as the puppy looks at the vacuum cleaner, it's able to get clicked and treated. If it approaches the vacuum cleaner, it can get clicked and treated. He's like, if I sit back here, does that pay? Because it's really hard to go close to that thing. And so now we're able to toss a treat away to get the puppy moving, and then it is able to approach. Contrast that with this border collie puppy who's like, oh, hey, you got a vacuum cleaner. So it's able to walk right up, and it's interacting with the person, it's readily able to eat, it's not keeping that distance between it and the vacuum cleaner, and it actually is a little bit more interested into uh, offering known behaviors. Can I give you a down? Can I give you a sit? Can I touch it with my nose? Uh, what can we do with this vacuum cleaner? Can we run around it in circles? And this is a dog who's had a very different exposure, and so that's really important to know that, you know, body language is gonna tell you a lot. In practice, you see puppies, right? So during these puppy appointments, we need to offer guided socialization. We also need to give them tools to increase the likelihood that socialization may go well. Pheromone products have been shown to improve socialization. There's a study with 45 puppies from week 12 to week 15 that were in a puppy class. And they were monitored up to one year of age. What we found was that longer, more positive interactions in play with their con specifics occurred with those who were wearing a active collar. Those play bouts that were positive and playful lasted 15 minutes or longer versus those with sham collars only lasted 10 minutes or so. It was significant in that there was less fear and anxiety in those same puppies. The less excitability also resulted with more overall improvement as reported by their owners and the trainer who was blinded in that class as to those who had an active Adapto collar. Now remember, Adapto comes in the junior collar, which is a perfect fit for small juveniles, but it also comes in a spray and in diffusers that we could utilize and help them be educated on how to Put that within their environment and we can certainly demonstrate that by having it for use within our clinic in our exam rooms and that can help them with the socialization process within our clinics as well. So when we look at a lot of things that we have happening in the clinic, I mean obviously our clinic we use a lot of adaptable products because we have animals we know who are going to be uncomfortable coming in to see us. We want to give them as much help as we can. And then when we're looking at how do we give our clients more help in the future when they're coming to us with puppies, one of the things we wanna think about is creating a behaviorally savvy puppy pack. All of us have puppy packs in our clinic, but what's in them? Are there things in there for heartworm prevention and flea prevention, but what about for behavior problem prevention? When we put together these behaviorally savvy puppy packs, we like to make sure we get a social butterfly checklist in there, or if you're part of Fear Free, there's social puppy bingo that's available as well. These two handouts are fantastic for being able to guide clients and help them recognize some things that may be scary or pop up in a puppy's future that they may not see now as a baby. So things like baby strollers and bikes, UPS people, uh, motorcycles, all sorts of things that might run into them when they're out in the park or out at a walk, hopefully not literally. There's the Ultimate Puppy Toolkit. This was a really fantastic set of books. There was a pictorial guide for socialization for new puppy owners. The cool thing about this is it's now online and available for free. So clients can actually go to the website and it's all right there. They can access it right on their phone. When we get a new puppy, oftentimes, you know, say I got my puppy in the fall. I may not be able to have them experience a thunderstorm or fireworks. But there are really great sound habituation CDs that you can purchase and have for sale at your clinic that cover a lot of different things like that so that the puppies can have exposure when they're young so that it's not such a big deal when they hear fireworks or gunshots. Uh, Victoria Stilwell and Through a Dog's Ear have collaborated and they have a really great city sound CD, thunderstorms and some other really great things. 
And it's the age of the internet. So if you look around, there's a ton of different products available. AVSAB also provides a fantastic puppy socialization position statement that again, reinforces everything that you're saying in the clinic as being factual and it gives them more references and a, something for them to look at at home to again, back up why this period of socialization is important and why it's important that they do the socialization process. Adaptal junior collars can be added to your behaviorally savvy puppy pack. Two collars are gonna cover this entire socialization period. It would be a wonderful way of ensuring that they have the benefit of having a pheromone support them through this process. Other recommendations and items you can tuck into that puppy pack. Again, the goal is to have clients come back to you and back to your clinic when they have a behavior problem in the future. So go ahead, put in handouts about house training, about cleaning up when they have a potty accident, reference products you carry. Is there information in there about mouthing and play biting or about toy selection? You can also download a trainer selection handout off of the AVSAB website. It helps guide clients to positive reinforcement trainers and help them select someone who's going to guide their puppy uh, in a correct path. Chewing is another big thing that we hear about from clients. So helping have that information there so that they know they can call you is really important. You can add in your regional topics, snakes, local laws, dog licenses, but again, don't forget these behavior related items that clients are gonna have questions about. Think about who do you want them to talk about when they have a problem? Because if they come back to you, you're gonna better be able to help that patient. When we do have patients in our practice, we wanna think about how comfortable are they? And how can we help them be a little bit more comfortable? So when there are scary things that happen, we want to pair really good things with that. So we're going to offer food with a lot of things. One of the things we need to remember is that scary things are from the puppy's perspective. So our team members are scary. The tools we use are scary. Touching a stethoscope to a puppy's chest can be scary. The rolling stools, the anesthesia machine, all of those things can be scary and frightening as well. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna monitor that puppy's ability to eat, we're gonna log what it eats, and we're also gonna be looking at the distance that the puppy has to be uh, to that scary thing in order to be able to eat. And all of this becomes part of the emotional record in the medical record. So we're gonna look at our little puppies again from the vacuum cleaner segment. And this is a good view of what your receptionists are looking at every day. It's the front of your clinic. So this little puppy is coming in through the front of the lobby and it's got a wide tail wag, ears are forward. It's able to offer cute behavior at the door. So it gave a nice little sit there and it's really excited to be here. It sees the technician it knows, it's jumping. We've got a wide, almost full body wag. Uh, and so the technician's gonna try and wait until it's got four feet on the floor before interacting. It really is excited. They'll shake off there because that can be stressful, but we're gonna run right across the scale to the next person. Um, that tail is still wagging, and we're gonna be able to use the puppy's name and have it come right back up onto the scale. It's able to offer a sit and receive some cookies. So, and it's even able to hand target. So ears may be back, but we've got that wag and we're able to eat. We're gonna contrast that with this little guy who is not as comfortable. So the technician sees the client is having a problem and they're going out to the front door as well to see if we can help get this puppy through the gate and then through the front door. So we're gonna see the tail low, the weight shifted back. We're gonna see some ears down. We may some see some lip, lip, lip licking with this puppy once it gets through the door. It's leaning forward to get the cookie, but all of that weight is shifted back. So it's really uncomfortable. He's not really thrilled about coming through this front door. So this is a very different experience. And this can be something, again, you're monitoring for as a team and you're putting it in the medical record. When we use food here at the Behavior Clinic, we like to think of it as being smart food, not the never ending buffet. So we use small pieces of food, the size of the end of a pencil eraser. If we're using anything that's lickable, like a spray cheese, it's one 1,000, two 1,000, three 1,000 gone. 
So about three seconds and then it's going to disappear. We're going to be taking measurements the entire time we're using food. What will the pet eat? When will it eat? And at what distance is it eating from the item that it's afraid of? It needs to be amazing. Not everybody's super excited about a dry kibble biscuit. So we have meat, we have cheese, we have canned food, all sorts of options in case a puppy is not eating uh, something that we initially offer. Every pet is an individual. Always remember to take into account those individual GI tracts uh, and keep everybody happy. We're gonna record, again, all of that food information in the medical record so that we know from one appointment to another, is this puppy starting out with a low value, maybe dry biscuit? And then at the next vaccine appointment, we've got to use spray cheese, which can tell us a lot of information about what this animal is putting together about that vaccine appointment. It's temporary. We're gonna use it for what we need to get done. So we're using it for procedures, and we're gonna remember that everything we pair can also create a negative learning experience. So we wanna be really cautious and think about how we're using food in the practice. So beyond those simple basics and kind of that discussion of normal behavior, what if we told you that we have information that can help you identify puppies who may have problems and who may be at risk? We do. And through team implementation, your team can work together to observe these guys. You can communicate with each other and you can educate your owners about what you're seeing so that it can allow you to intervene and help these puppies go on to stay in their homes. That useful intervention and in behavior all comes from Dr. Martin Gobu in Canada, where he did a study involving 102 puppies from eight to 16 weeks of age within his veterinary practice. What he did is he had a film standardized physical examination within that clinic. It started on the floor with observation. It moved to the exam room table with the DVM, and then it ended with the physical examination, the manipulation portion being performed on the floor. What did they look for? So in the study, they looked when they were on the floor for exploration, the level of activity, the facial expression of that puppy, the social interaction with those within the room and the vocalization that they did. When they were on the table and when they were on the floor during the manipulation portion, they were looking at the interaction with the veterinarian, the puppy's facial expression and ear position. But really what you care about is what did they see? So 10% of the puppies were extremes. They were outliers within that population. That extreme puppy showed active avoidance, increased locomotion, they were all over the place, increased panting, and lots of vocalization. It was often correlated across contexts, meaning you would see it when they were on the floor, on the table, and again when they were on the floor. Panting was the most consistent. 60% of the time, the outliers panted. That's really important. That's easy to pick out. I mean, in general, our clinics should be climate controlled, right? It shouldn't be they're walking into a sauna. So if they're coming in and they've acclimated to our temperature within the clinic, even if it's an 80 degree day out there, they're usually in our clinic more than 10 minutes before we see them as a DVM. If they're still panting, it should be observed, recorded, and taken note of. So what now? If you observe that puppy, for two minutes while you're in the exam room, you can integrate that into any conventional veterinary visit. You can watch for these behaviors. And then what we really need to know from here, right, is did that correlate for problems in the future? Well, I can tell you that yes, they grow into problems, not out of their problems. That's what every, every puppy owner really wants to know, is this going to persist forever? Possibly, it could if we don't make enough movement in the baseline of that puppy's behavior. So the follow-up study involved 42 of those puppies that were filmed in the veterinary clinic when they were 8 to 16 weeks of age. They were filmed again at their one-year appointment. They were observed when they were free on the floor and when they were manipulated on the floor during the physical exam. What did we see? There was a correlation of panting, yawning, lip licking, 
defecating, and holding their ears slicked backward. The persistence of these behaviors shows that as adults, identification as a puppy will identify an abnormal extreme adult later on in life. So yes, they grow into the problem. It persists. It does not just go away. So one of the things we can say is that knowing normal helps us identify abnormal. And so it's just a quick reminder at this point, you know, normal is going to be where puppies are willing to approach novel objects. So if you're in the exam room, you're kneeling down on the floor, you offer an ophthalmoscope and they can't approach you, you know, that can be some concerning behavior that we need to watch for. You know, are these puppies exploring away from their sleeping quarters or are they just hanging out and resting in the same spot at home? Um, are they comfortable sleeping alone or do they always have to be with another animal in the home or the human? Um, are we attracted to these urination and defecation odors, hopefully in the areas where clients want them to go potty? Or are we still having some soiling like in the sleeping area where this puppy is resting? Fear postures develop later in the stage of social development. So if we're seeing fear postures at six, seven, eight weeks of age, again, this should be something that we are looking at as something we need to step in and intervene with. That sociability should decrease at the end of 12 weeks and not before then. So what does this mean for you in the veterinary practice? Again, your whole team is involved in this. From the first time that client walks through the door and interacts with your receptionist or even on the phone call, you know, we are the team who can identify these problems and observe, talk about them with each other, and be able to get these guys help. We are the team that needs to guide our owners on appropriate socialization. We have to educate them how it's to occur, not just provided in that behaviorally savvy puppy kit. We also have to talk about it with every opportunity. And I do mean DVMs. I don't mean just the rest of your team. That is a critical key. Puppies given advice on their first visit, or at least their families given advice on their first visit by the doctor, have decreased soiling, mounting, nonstop play, mouthing, begging, aggression to people and dogs. The list is long, but it's because that DVM took the time during that first appointment to make it relevant and salient to that client to bring it to their attention. It was in contrast to a placebo where they did not get that intervention. We need to help them provide action steps so that they can intervene because we can make a difference if we take the time. Yes, the whole team needs to be a player, but that does include DVMs taking an action point at that first visit and subsequent ones to become relevant in the behavioral life of that dog. So why? Well, yeah, you see puppies, that's why, but you see them during the sensitive period. And what happens during the sensitive period? Well, they move to a new home, they get adopted, they move out of the shelter, they go to somebody else's routine and expectation platform. Just because they were in one home initially and moving to a new one doesn't mean that laying on the couch is going to be acceptable in the second home. We have to make sure we understand where that client is coming from and help them have appropriate expectations for the change. Now, we also do things to them. We vaccinate them, we take their rectal temperature, and we put things on their chest. What guest comes into their home and puts a stethoscope and holds it there? No, you pet and you move on. So we do interactions as unfamiliar people during the sensitive period of time that others do not, and that's important to remember. Scary things happen, sometimes slightly painful, or at least things that you would want to avoid, like a needle, are going to occur and we need to try and help that individual socialize as a process to these things in appropriate manner so that they can continue to receive them for the wellness uh, in duration for their life. Now hospitalization for illness may also occur, hopefully not, but if it does that is a complete disrupt you know, disruption in their household routine and also in the environment that that puppy is being exposed to. And that's important because again, we need to recognize that the 
individual being hospitalized is within a socialization period and maybe we take extra means to have it be an extra positive experience as much as we can within what's going on because they are socializing and making learning judgments at that moment that can impact the life of that dog within our practice. So we create awareness during this period of time. When we're working with these puppies in the clinic, we want to be very aware of body language. That's their primary means of communicating their level of comfort with us. So knowing that, for instance, panting can be an indicator behavior of future problems, that's one of the things we're gonna watch for. We're gonna be watching for that pacing and excessive motor activity. So when that lab comes in and they are all over your lobby and all over you and your team, that's something we need to go, wait a minute, we're gonna to need to see if this gets better or if this stays the same from appointment to appointment. You know, are we seeing any lip licking? Are we seeing the puppy dive underneath the exam room chair and not come out? Uh, and we can't get them to move and we put them on the table and they just freeze and stare at the ceiling. Uh, do we have active avoidance of us and yawning? All of that's what we're watching for while we're doing these exams. So here's our little nervous puppy from before, and this time he's on the exam table. So we're going to be offering some food, then Rachel's going to come in, let him see the stethoscope. We get a little tail wag there. He's still able to continue licking and eating. So we're having the owner offer some food. So this is peanut butter on a pretzel rod. You know, while we're having that stethoscope in contact. And now we're going to go for ears. So in between these things, you can see the video has been cut. If we're not touching the puppy, ideally we want this food to kind of go away for a second and then come back before we start that procedure to happen. But he's able to eat throughout all of this interaction, which is really nice and that's what we want to see. So your listening skills are vital because that client is telling you things even when they're not directly um, discussing the behavioral life of their dog. They may di directly discuss it, biting, mouthing, jumping. Those are the ones that often come up first. We often ask, how's house training going? Are they learning that outside is where they need to eliminate? But things that you may not pick up on readily and things that often get mentioned within my office are, my goodness, my whole life is turned upside down. There's a disruption in their lifestyle. They can't do things sometimes such as just going to the bathroom without their dog, destroying the entire house. Or the need for having 24 hour supervision. I can't even be away from him. He can't even be crated. He's tied to me all the time. It is important when there are human health concerns. Some clients are on blood thinners. Puppy teeth are sharp. Those two things don't play well together. Knowing and having the benefit of knowledge on what's going on with your clients can help us provide interventions such as things we talked about with the puppy pack. Can we redirect them to appropriate chew items? Can we help that client carry things around to put in their mouth instead of their arm? Um, having that knowledge, you can have vital um, discussion on keeping that puppy within that home because this is really a critical period where they may not be able to persist within that home if it doesn't work. Now there are times where other species in the home mix and you know they, they may not do well with that puppy behavior. My cats are hiding all the time doc. I don't know what to do. Well, yeah, I know the puppies in your office, but those cats are potentially your clients as well. And so trying to toggle between the two and give them information on not only containing some of that puppy behavior, but also helping those felines in the house be enriched and have alternate areas to go to and cat sanctuaries can be really important. So listening and getting all of that information when your clients are at their wits end becomes extremely important because Again, it may be said during the exam, but it could have been said at the front desk. And so as a team approach, we need to make sure that we all are listening for this. And that gets relayed as that puppy moves through the clinic. So that front desk team member makes a note within the chart that says, oh my goodness, cats are hiding all the time. She mentioned Fluffy, he hasn't been seen in a week, but she knows he's under the bed. That should get relayed and everybody should be addressing what are the vital key points on behavioral health during that time in the clinic. 
One of the other things that is really a lot of fun to add into your practice and also can help you identify these puppies early on. And this is actually one of the things we do as the behavior clinic. We, be, we believe so strongly in puppy socialization that that's one of the classes that we actually offer as part of the practice. So this is a value added service. It's age specific. So puppies six to 16 weeks are the ones who are allowed to enroll in the class. It's run by a veterinary team member. In our clinic, it's run by a veterinary nurse. And we also have a veterinary assistant who helps run this course too. They are the eyes and ears for our practice on these puppies who are coming in as they grow and as they interact with each other in these classes. We get a lot of information. As problems emerge, we're able to help direct these clients to more help uh, and provide lemonade when they need assistance. The other thing I love is that we're controlling the disease exposure because it's in our practice. We know how we clean. We know what's there. And so we're making sure that we're keeping these little babies safe. It's all about bonding. These can be done in lots of different formats. And I know when Rachel does her lecture here in a couple weeks, she's gonna go into that in a lot more detail. But we do them weekly, bi-monthly, monthly, however works for your practice. The goal is to get these puppies in, get them through your door, and to be able to have eyes and ears on these guys as they grow. When they're coming in, we're doing controlled learning. We're helping these clients learn how to socialize to unfamiliar and novel items. So we're going to be having sounds playing in the background. We're going to have different sub traits and different items on the floor that they can walk on. They're going to see different people who are not just their family members. And we even have a fun costume box uh, that we like to encourage people to test out. Uh, animals. If you have a clinic cat, put him to work. This is a great way for them to earn their kibble. Because uh, who doesn't need to see a cat when you're a puppy? And then equipment. You can pull in medical equipment. You can pull in novel things like here we have a little wagon, a kid's toy. And this little golden probably doesn't have kids at home, but it's something else for them to see and interact with, which is really nice. The, these social groups should be restricted, like Amanda said, 6 to 16 weeks of age but that's not the only way they can be segregated out. There's different sizes and there's different activity levels. And that needs to be well thought of when you look at these different play groups, because it's not a free for all. Six puppies maximum to keep it under control, able to be supervised, and to make sure that that activity level is well monitored. Why do we worry about that? Well, yes, it's a physical developmental stage and this, you know, play is really helpful. We all know that a playful puppy is often a tired puppy, but it needs to be practiced for appropriate adult behavior. They're practicing communication and other very critical behavioral patterns. If we allow it to be a free for all, that's not going to help them develop into a controlled adult. So yes, they need to have appropriate play, but it also needs to be interrupted when it becomes too much out of control. Who's ready to see some puppies? <laughs> so this is a little video montage here. So we have a really happy bouncy border collie with a happy bouncy German Shepherd. Yes, they are the same age or within one week of each other. So what we like to see is role reversals. So the little dog is chasing the big dog and then the big dog will chase the little dog. We like to see play bows. We like to see pauses in play like that one where they take a moment, take a breath, check in, and then they can get back to it. So a lot of these guys get a chance to bounce around. The little puppy that you're seeing on the fence in the backside is someone who's not as comfortable with these other dogs moving around. So he's actually getting paid for looking at these two rowdy goofballs roughhouse. Uh, and helping to learn that the other dogs moving are actually a lot of fun. Here we've got Labradors, and if you watch these guys carefully, you'll see uh, there's a little bit of arousal happening. So there'll be some pilo erection over the shoulders and hips as these two run around and wrestle with each other. Again, puppies of the same age, same size. And if we get worried about arousal, this is where we're gonna be interrupting and calling these puppies to segregate them out. So here we've got another size difference. And in puppy class, you may see some puppies that retreat under items. The goal is that they should be able to retreat, but they're still interested in interacting and they may come out. So this little border collie has actually made a game out of running underneath the chair, luring the German shorthair in 
uh, and then running and hiding under the next little hidey hole. But they're able to have some role reversal. Everybody is, you know, mouthing on each other. It's a great way to learn how sharp those teeth are. And uh, they're checking each other out. We want to see nice play bows between these two. Uh, so there we go, right there. And so then we're going to, you know, play a little bit. We've got lots of wiggling, lots of bouncing. And then the border collie comes out. Her tail is up. Her ears are forward. She's going to shoot underneath that desk. And they're just having a really good time and hanging out uh, being buddies, which is really nice. One of the things we always need to remember, socialization classes are not training classes, and that's not how we market them in our practice. Our socialization is where we're going to teach clients how to socialize outside of class. Uh, it's all about teaching owners what to do. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about body language with these clients as well, because our clients are taking their dogs out of their home environment. They're going to the dog park. They're going to the corner bar that has a patio. Um, they're going to Lowe's and Home Depot with these guys. So we want these owners to be aware of what does a puppy who's concerned look like versus what does a puppy who is comfortable look like. That way they can set their own puppy up for success and be a better advocate for their puppy out in public. We also go over basic problem education, chewing, mouthing, jumping. Those are common questions that happen during this time period. We may also be introducing the clicker, talking about sit, down, target, and name. All of it depends on the amount of time that you want to invest in your classes and how frequently you want to do them. The goal is to provide that early intervention to have those eyes and ears on these guys so that that way you can step in, see that there's something, and help that client get to a little bit more help. But really what we get asked are, are these socialization classes safe? These age-restricted classes carry more reward than risk, and that is important to remember. ABSAB has a socialization position statement, as mentioned before, that goes through a lot of this. But the benefit of the socialization process occurs when you're within the period, and that's all before 12 weeks of age. Attendance and socialization classes has been shown to increase the retention of that puppy within the home and decrease undesirable reactions to non-household dogs. Those are important things. That's what I see dogs for later on is problem behaviors in relation to other dogs or other things. So if there's something that can be done to reduce the likelihood and to make sure that we keep them with this particular client, then we should be advocating for that, which is a socialization class. But again, it needs to occur before 12 weeks of age. So we want to make sure vaccinations are started, parasite and disease free, but remember uh, there's been a study that shows no association between canine parvovirus with the attendance at puppy socialization classes. And that's really important. I mean, if we can set them up to be appropriately socialized to different interactions, that reduces the likelihood of them leaving this home, reduces the likelihood of problems that that client has to deal with, and that puppy has to experience, we should be advocating for it. And that's what a socialization class does. Can you believe you've already spent almost an entire hour with us? So we've enjoyed having you, even though we don't get to see you. Um, <clears throat> we'd love for you to join us uh, for the next session that we're doing, which is going to be all how we intervene when we see puppies who are showing some of these problematic behaviors uh, in the exam room or uh, in the clinic or in puppy class. So we're going to be spending a whole hour here in a couple weeks uh, talking about that, and we'd love to have you back. So I believe I saw it pop up that we had some questions. So, and you guys are always welcome. If you have anything you'd like to email us directly, it's information at thebehaviorclinic.com. Uh, you're welcome to reach out to us uh, and we can answer your questions as well. Jessica? Alrighty, thank you guys so much. We do have a few questions. Oh, hang on, I might have to unmute you on my computer. One moment as we escape again. <laughs> okay, Jessica, are you there now? Yes, can you hear me? <laughs> I can. It's like a Verizon commercial, guys. 
<laughs> All right, we do have a handful of questions. So the first is, how do you explain to an owner the balance of adequate puppy socialization while still protecting the puppy from getting exposed before they are fully vaccinated? Ah, great question. So one of the things that you should reference is that AVSAV position statement on puppy socialization. Uh, the, the goal is that if they can get in and get their first vaccine series, then go ahead and start socializing. The actual problem behaviors that you see are actually more life-threatening than some of the diseases that you will see. So I tell my clients that, you know, I'm not going to take my puppy who's had just one vaccine to a dog park. Um, I'm probably not going to take my dog to a dog park anyway, but that's a different lecture. Um, but really what I'm going to say is, you know, stick to clean surfaces, stick to experiences that are safe and not over the top. So if I'm going to take them for a walk, I'm taking them on a paved surface and I'm going to be taking them and, and reinforcing them for seeing lots of different things things that I need this dog to see for the life of, of my family with them. Um, when this dog that you're looking at in, on the screen is Alice Louise, um, she is my heart, and um, this dog did go to soccer games, and she did go to puppy socialization class and have play. It was done with me pre-checking and making sure that they did sanitation. And it was done through my clinic as well. But I did pre-check and make sure that um, I knew that it was going to be appropriate, again, from what I do. And, and that's really where, you know, me being a client of someone else's practice, potentially, I should be gaining that experience and education on, well, what does that look like? I mean, if you should be calling when you talk to these trainers and finding out how do they sanitize in that environment? Are they cleaning? Are they doing it at the fairgrounds in the pig barn? I mean, like, we need to find out what's happening and be able to educate our clients on trying to pick um, trainers and environments that actually are clean and sanitizable, but also appropriate for the lifestyle that that dog needs to live within. Yeah. And that was really important for us to be able to have her have that exposure because she needs to be okay to stick around for the next 16 years, let's hope. Yeah. And on a counter to that, I mean, the short hair is mine. Um, so I have gun dogs, I do gun dog items. And so he's going to get his first set of vaccines. And yeah, we're going out to the field. He's on a heartworm preventive, a flea preventive, parasite prevention, but it's not going to keep me from taking him to uh, a training field where he's going to see tall grass and an ATV and uh, birds in a box at a distance. Um, so it's all about making sure you have good prevention on board and ask a lot of great questions about where you're going. Good question. Next question. All righty. Thank you. Um, puppy visits have a lot of information. Often clients seem a little overwhelmed with it. Behavioral information is critically important. How do we discuss it in a way that stresses its importance without increasing the information overload at puppy visits? I think one of the things to do is having a running a dialogue, which we all tend to do um, when we're doing an examination, but also don't forget to make note of the behavior that that dog is doing. Make, make a dialogue on, okay, this is what we're seeing. This is how we're looking for normal behavior or comfortable behavior is probably the better word. Yeah. And being able to have that client start to get the education on reading their individual. They mm -hmm. think it's a cute puppy. That's why they got it, but they need to know what is their dog telling them because it doesn't speak English so that when they're not in the exam room, they're able to see what that dog's trying to tell them about the environment and the interactions that they're in, mm -hmm. having with, yeah. with people and things. Yeah, and there are all sorts of ways that you can get really creative because there are a lot of things. Yeah, you're trying to go through that puppy checklist. You gotta talk about all of these different things and oh yeah, by the way, behavior. Um, so when you're looking at that, don't be afraid to get creative and, and you know, have kind of a set, these are the things we talk about at the first appointment and we're gonna start talking about body language, for instance. And then you want to say, you know what, we also have this puppy social program. That's another way to help be able to cover a lot of that information and not have to do it all in your exam room. 
We also live in the age of technology, so you can get super creative. Most practices have a website. Uh, you could develop your own little puppy education series about behavior that is a little series of short videos that is available in a folder on your website, or that you can email clients after they come in for their first puppy visit. Uh, you can have Facebook posts, you can do podcasts. I mean, you can get as creative as you want with some of these things as other ways to spread out the information so that you're avoiding that information overload. You also wanna think about, again, is this a 15 minute appointment or a 30 minute appointment? These puppy visits, I mean, honestly should be booked for at least 30 minutes because there's just so much that you have to go over to get these guys off on the right foot. Great question. It's a, it's a big problem and challenge, I should say. Okay, what else do you have, Jess? Um, so another one, we will be starting our puppy classes next week, but our requirement is 10 to 24 weeks because our medical director wanted puppies to have at least their second DHPP. What are your thoughts on this? Have your medical director read the ABSAB position statement for one, um, but two, I mean, I, I'm not sure what I can say except for this last hour we've talked about how it's up to 12 to 16 weeks of age that you're making the biggest impact. If there is no way to change that policy, then there needs to be a heavy program when they're coming in during those first vaccines to encourage the client to do all that they can on their own without your help. Um, really at that point, it's gonna be them doing it when they're going out and about because they're living their life, they're doing it anyway. So set them up to be successful really hit it hard when they're coming in during that period of time and help them and encourage them to understand what needs to be socialized too, such as persons, um, there's animals, there's inanimate objects, there's different environment, there's substrates and there's sounds. Those six categories need to be hit hard by your clients before they're coming in. Mm -hmm. And then you need to be polishing it because you're at the end of the socialization period at that period of, or at that point in time. But I would encourage you strongly to get your data um, and to look at a lot of the things that um, I referenced as far as uh, data that's been published. You're welcome to email me and I can send you some of those documents to help make your case as to why it should happen before that period of time. I think the other thing in running a lot of these puppy programs is that once you get over that 12 to 16 week, week age group, the play changes. Yeah. And it becomes much more like adolescent teenagers. Um, and so some of, if you've got a 12 week old puppy in there and a 24 week old puppy, your 12 week old puppy may get in trouble. Um, so you're gonna wanna plan on being able to segregate out those puppies by age group if you're not able to kind of change this thought process a little bit um, and be able to have, okay, here's my young guys and here's my older teenagers and they don't play together. Um, unless there's somebody who's really shy um, versus, or somebody who's super outgoing. Um, but really being very careful about those age groups. We're not dropping our toddlers off with the high school students. That's weird. So, yeah. <laughs> so so it, it, there is a really definitive break when you're watching these dogs play and how it, how it develops. Very true. Great question. Good luck to you. We're here to support you any way we can. Any other questions, Jessica? Uh, yes, um, the next one is we currently offer socialization classes three times a week during the day with no owner present. Should we look at offering classes with the owner present? Yes, please. Um, I always tell my clients, because I have a lot of clients who are like, Amanda, can you just take this dog home with you? Um, and I say no, because I don't live with your dog. I think what you're doing is super cool, but you really have to get that owner involved as well. Because the question is, what happens once they leave your care? You can do super awesome things there, but if the owner doesn't know the process of what they're supposed to be doing and how they're supposed to be doing it, what's happening once they leave you? And I like to think of, you know, some things that I do within this business are at, at finger touch distance. So I can't care more than other people about their individual animals. And if I am trying to socialize their animals by myself as a clinic, I'm only going to take them so far. I'm only going to move things so far. The best thing I can do is advocate 
and educate. If I educate the masses, my experience and knowledge becomes exponential. And so by educating that client, I am passing on the information, not only for that individual dog, but also for all subsequent dogs. Education is key and power. And by being able to have that client understand body language, make appropriate choices, they're going to help socialize in every day in other interactions and outside of this clinic. And that is what's going to make you, you and your knowledge that you're providing in a wonderful service, yes, that you're providing, but much more exponentially powerful than you doing it by yourself. So I applaud you because that's really cool, yeah. but I would also encourage you to expand that and to help empower your owners to go out and, and service the need that's also out there for them to do. Great. Alrighty, we only have time for a couple more questions. Um, the next one is, it seems impossible to expose puppies to every possible novel object sound scenario. Is it sufficient to expose them to a handful of objects or as many objects as possible? I think that's probably all that's realistic. I mean, I can hammer all that I want that you should be doing everything that this animal is going to expose to. And I mean, I think that our job is to set the bar as high, not low. Um, maybe that's because all, we're all AAA personalities, but I mean, truly, I think that the more that you expose to in an appropriate way, at an appropriate distance with appropriate food reinforcement is going to set your animal up to think that gee, everything novel mm -hmm. is exciting and reinforcing. Yeah. That's the key, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to say I've seen everything before because you know what? I hope to God I never say that <laughs> by the time I'm 80. I want to continually experience new things, but I have learned in my life that new things are exciting and reinforcing and potentially gratifying. And that's because of the process of generalization. Yeah. So having enough things that you see allows you to generalize that new experiences are potentially reinforcing. And that is all we're trying to do. There is no number that someone's come up with that is scientifically proven to be your cutoff. And every individual is different. So you really need to do enough being an unknown quantity, X, to be able to say that this individual can generalize. So the more you can do, the better. And that's, I think, the bottom line is we strive for the high bar, but we take what we can get. I like to think of it as, you know, it's, it's muscle memory. You're teaching the animal how to learn about novel things for the rest of their life and also helping the owner learn how to do that as well. So yeah, it should be a lot of fun and it should be something that do as much as you can do. And then um, like Rachel is gonna talk about in her puppy socialization section is that does become something that's a little bit different when you get into abnormal puppies because some of those abnormal puppies are gonna go at a much slower pace uh, and it's gonna be a little bit different for those guys. So yeah, good question. Alrighty, and our last question will be, do you recommend charging for the puppy socialization classes? Oh, that's me. That's me. Um, so, yeah. so yes, I'm a practice manager. This has value. It has value to our clients. Um, this is time and education that our team members have put in to be able to do this. Does it need to be $100 an hour? Not necessarily, but I do want you to make enough that covers your overhead to have the lights on, to be able to cover the tools you're going to use, the team members who are going to be involved in providing it. Mm -hmm. uh, and if it makes a little money, great. Is this going to be a super awesome profit driver? Probably not when you think about the revenue that's derived strictly off of socialization classes. However, what I get is the, oh, by the way, uh, can I get some heartworm medication while I'm here, or I need a bag of food, or um, I thought I saw a flea. So you're going to get a lot of uh, external revenue that's, that's going to be driven off of this because they're in your clinic where you have your products and they're going to ask you other questions. So that's a lot of fun. Not only that, but remember they're coming to hopefully your clinic. I mean, they're coming to you. So not only are they, yes, dropping the random heart guard question, but they really are coming and practicing 
repeated behavior that you want them to occur. You want them to come back to your practice. You want them to ask you these questions. You don't want them to go to Joe Schmo, you know, shingle hanging up down the street saying they're a dog trainer. You are the definitive resource and you are practicing that behavior with your client. And so, yes, it may not make you as much money as doing a spay, but it, it will be invaluable when you keep that dog in the home. Because remember, that was one of the things I talked about. If that puppy stays in that home and that puppy sees you until they're 16, it is immeasurably valuable, even if all you're doing is covering, keeping the lights on while yeah. you run that practice yep. appointment. Yeah. So, yeah, that's great. My... Great question. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, ladies, so much. And um, for everybody attending the webinar, be sure to check out the next in the series, Providing Lemonade, sponsored by SIBA. And you will get to hear Dr. Feltis and Amanda speak again. That will be Wednesday, June 19th at 8 p.m. Eastern time. So thank you so much, Dr. Feltis and Amanda. Thank you, SIBA, for sponsoring us today. And thank you, everyone, for joining the webinar today. You'll be able to find this recorded webinar on fearfreepets.com within the next week or two. Thanks again, and have a great night. Thank you. Thank you.